paper at all. So. Okay, um, go ahead and get started with today's lecture. Um, I did grade the first two problems of the test. That second problem used up a lot more red ink than I thought it would. Um, so that was a little surprising, but um, we'll see how the rest of it goes. Um, so today we're going to delve into more details of polymerization. And um, this, as you talked about last time, or there's this process of, of taking monomers and turning them into a polymer. And there are restrictions in terms of how we can do that. Um, restrictions, uh, especially of, of purity. Uh, everything goes to hell in a handbag if the purity is even a little bit off. And uh, we're going to hear more about that type of detail today. So um, this is all along the same lines as what we were discussing last time. <coughs> and this is a reaction that converts monomers to a polymer. And primarily, as I we talked last, last time, it's mostly a linear process, you know, just shooting off in two directions away from some starting point. And so today we're going to learn more details about what starts that process of shooting off in these two different directions, <coughs> in which we ideally take a certain number of monomers and convert all of them to a single polymer. That's kind of how we like to think about it. Um, that's more of a, an aspirational goal than a practical one, but um, it is something that is part of what we're shooting for when we conduct the process of polymerization. And the one we've been talking about so far has been chain polymerization or addition polymerization. Those are two names for the same thing. Um, and they apply to monomers having a double bond. So we talked about ethylene gas, and, uh, propene gas, and styrene is kind of a gas. Uh, all these have a double bond. Those double bonds can break open and react with other monomers that are doing the same thing. And today we'll learn how that process takes place. And so it's a very simple uh, algebraic reaction of M sub N plus M goes to M sub N plus 1. And then we also have uh, what's called step growth polymerization, which is the condensation polymerization. Again, two names for the same thing. And uh, these are, as you learned, uh, processes that in the end, they crank out something else besides the polymer, the condensate. That's what we call them, condensation pol polymerizations. And we have these different functional groups, carboxylate, COR, OH, NH2, CHO, NCO, epoxy. Um, so hopefully you've kind of committed what those, those letters mean in terms of structural components to memory, or will soon. Um, because I'm going to assume you know what those are. And as you saw last time, we can do all kinds of things. We can make all sorts of different, very useful polymers, biomedical polymers, structural polymers, um, optical polymers, all from these types of reactions that involve combining these components in new and different ways. And so this can involve taking um, components that are slightly different from each other and combining them together and producing this condensate. All right. And so that's how we get things like uh, urethane, polyurethane, is by combining two different things rather than two of the same things. So hopefully that's clear. As is the following, so we have these types of different reactions, and, and we'll see more of this today, where we have uh, components that will react, but then not go anywhere. And so that's what we'll talk more about this today, is where we, we try to make sure we have components that will keep on going. Um, this was sort of the algebraic thing from last time, and you know that, just looking at it hopefully by now, that C is the best option, A is certainly not, and the others just aren't going to give us the high molecular weights that we, we have to have if we want to actually make a plastic. All right, we don't want to make floor wax, we don't want to make a ligamers, we want to make high polymers, very long high molecular have We have these guys, first off we need a poly, um, polymer, polymer, polymer that, um, let's hold on a second. Yeah, so we have these two options. I skipped ahead, that's why I did this. So we have here that has an end, and that end is not reactive. And this guy also has an end, and that end is not reactive. Okay, now this turns out this first one can also polymerize, bless you, uh, to make a polymer as well. So I was thinking ahead to this polymers. And same thing holds true for this slide, so I'm surprised I still have. I thought I got rid of this. We still have some that will work and some that won't in terms of which direction they're Why can only see unglossed approach? Why what? Why can only see unglossed approach here? 
Why could you only see what growth? Why could only see undergo the step growth? Oh, sure. So we yeah, okay, I was looking at the slide in which if you want to make a polyamide, that's not going to give us a polyamide, all right? And these guys have the types of functional groups that will allow the process to keep going. This one does not, all right? And so again, starting out from a central point and hopefully going off in two directions. That's the general concept here. Going to go in. Okay. So. Why was the previous one like the. And so the types of polymerizations that are available to us, and this gets into a little more of the details now. So we've been talking about double bonds that for some reason react with each other. All right. So today we're going to go into and find out what that reason is. And that reason in this context is what's called free radical polymerization. And um, does anybody know what a free radical is? One person. Like what? Isn't it like a hydrogen ion? Uh, hydrogen ion can be considered a free radical, yeah, but this is a molecular version of that. Anybody else? Yeah, so you've that's seen it. to do with like an electron that's like uh, basically a solo paired electron that's like ready to. Else. Yeah, exactly. So what, what it kind of relates to is you take a bond, and it's got a certain number of electrons in it, usually two in the granite case, and you cut that bond. And one electron goes to the one end, the other electron goes to the other end, and they're desperate to find something to react with. All right, they're, they're absolutely going to react with anything that comes close enough. All right, and so that's why this is such an effective technique, because you generate this species that is just desperate to find something to react with. And this, again, is why purity isn't so important in these systems, because if you have a, um, a molecule of oxygen kicking around in the reactor, it'll react with that as well, which is not going to give you a polymer. All right, so it's going to find something, and ideally it can only find other monomers to react with. We have other techniques that are similar in a way that they involve ions rather than free radicals, and so we have these very charged species that can also react with other monomers and start to form polymer chains. Um, we don't talk a lot about that, but I'll show you a couple of examples here. Uh, this whole process is dependent on the initial step, which is in initiated by a specific active species. And so those double bonds don't just react because they're bored. They have to be kicked into that process to make this free radical, giving us a molecule having an unpaired electron. And in almost all cases I know, it's highly reactive. I don't know, I don't know about an un a non-highly reactive free radical. I've never seen that before. But anyway, so this free radical is likely to take place in chemical reactions. And this is one example that you'll see a little bit more of in which we have this phenyl group, carbonyl, the ether oxygen. All right, we all know what those are now, right? Okay, and what we've done is we have created, on the end of that oxygen, we've created this free radical shown as a dot. All right, and it's going to react. And in this case, we want it to react with a monomer. Okay. Cations, cation polymerization, ion having a positive charge like sodium and potassium that can be put on an end of a chain can also react with a monomer under the right conditions. And then uh, similarly, a negatively charged ion or an anion, and this is one example here showing you this. You guys are used to seeing, you know, metal anions, but we also have organic anions. And those can also react with monomers to start the process of polymerization. So we'll talk mostly about free radical polymerization because it's the one that is really practiced the most. Uh, the others are certainly useful, but um, in terms of uh, commodity polymers, we're typically talking about free radical polymerization. So it's one of the most common and useful reactions for producing polymers. It used to make polymers from vanillic monomers, which means a lot of what we talked about. All right, vanillic means it has a double bond. Uh, polyvinyl chloride reflects that in its name. All right, it's a double bond, two, two carbons, and chlorine on one of those carbons. All right, so that's one of the few that does that. Uh, polyethylene again starts with the same type of species, double bond between two carbons. All right, so those are all vinyl groups. So these double double bond, these carbon double bonds are reactive under the right circumstances. Yes. Uh, can you sketch what you just mentioned, like the chlorine? Sure, the sure. So if we talk about vinyl chloride, the two carbons, the double bond between them, and uh, vinyl chloride is just this. All right? 
And so you bust that open and react it with other vinyl chloride monomers, and you have PVC. All right. And so, you know, we think about these things as algebra. You swap out CH3, you have propylene, uh, polypropylene, you swap out hydrogen, you have ethylene. All right. So it should all make sense. So free radical polymerization proceeds in three steps, three very important steps. First off is the initiation process, where the first free radical is formed and the growth of the chain is initiated. And this is something that uh, we need, it needs help. It doesn't, the, these, these mo vinyl monomers don't do this on their own because they're bored or because we heat them up a lot. All that, that does work, but it's not very well controlled. We use something else to kick the process off. Then we follow that by propagation in which the polymer chains grow. So we're adding monomers in two directions, ideally, and they're shooting off and um, forming polymer chains, although as a minute, in a minute you'll see that it isn't quite the way it works. And termination at the end is where the polymer chain growth is terminated, all right, where chains stop growing and they're no longer going to increase in molecular weight. And ideally, when we want really high molecular weights, we want this to take some time before it can reach that, that point. But as you see later on, it actually doesn't take a whole lot of time. It does take a certain amount of time. But under the right conditions, you can still get to high molecular weights even if you don't um, have a lot of time available. So we'll talk more about that. All right, so a couple things. These are the initiators that are very widely used. One is benzoyl peroxide. Did you guys ever hear of benzoyl peroxide before? Hopefully, yes, no? I've seen that, I've seen an OCHEM. It's one they use as an example of a taxite, I think. A what? A taxite? A taxite, an OCHEM, I don't know. It's, I think I've seen it like being snapped into an OCHEM. Yeah, it's yeah, it's used for that purpose as well. But it's also been used historically, I don't know if it still is, but for acne medication. And what it does is that it diffuses under your skin and this breaks up, generates an oxygen molecule and then the anaerobic bacteria don't like oxygen. So that's how it, it helps get rid of these types of vaccine infections. And so it, it's a molecule that's designed to break apart. And under the right conditions, we can use it to polymerize polymer chains. Another example, which is, which is even prettier, even though it's not as familiar, azobis isobutyl nitrile or AIBN. And uh, what this does is it breaks up and gives you nitrogen gas. All right, it doesn't get any much cleaner than nitrogen gas in terms of byproducts. And so this is a, a very handy group of reactions. And what's important about them is the fact that they have a pronounced ability, whoops, come on, a pronounced ability to fall apart, which normally isn't a good thing, but in this case is very, very important. And so, as I mentioned a minute ago, you, know, you can take ethylene gas and heat it up to, I don't know, 250, and it'll polymerize, but it'll be out of control. The whole thing will just go in all directions. With these species, we polymerize at a lower temperature, we get more control, we get more linear species, we don't have all the defects in the polymer chain, and so we use these on purpose to be present and cause this process to take place. And so, in terms of what they do, the AIBN is shown here. And what we're, what we're talking about, and this is, gets into alpha beta transfers and all that stuff that you guys don't need to know, but you have this AIBN breaks up and in doing so it transfers electrons to this, this pair of nitrogen atoms and gives you the uh, triple bond nitrogen, which is nitrogen gas. At the same time though, as that's being generated, you're generating some free radicals. All right, so these are ready and raring to go find something and start the process of polymerization. Benzoyl peroxide is um, similar, but at least under the conditions for polymerization, you don't get oxygen gas. Instead, it just takes these oxygens and breaks it up and generates free radicals right there in between those oxygen atoms, okay? And this is because both of these um, uh, groups are are designed to be pulling electrons away from what's holding them together. So that they're primed to fall apart. So you think of these bonds as, you know, they look like normal bonds, but they don't have as much uh, electrons in them as normal bonds because they're, they're just itching to break. And that's what the process does, is it breaks them, moves the electrons around, and generates these fragments. And in this case, the um, benzoyl peroxide does something more, which is to transfer electrons even further and then gives you the phenyl group with the 
the free radical, the electron, ready to find something to react with, and carbon dioxide. Again, another nice thing to have in your reactor because it's totally inert. It doesn't react with anything. We talked about water last time and managing water and making sure you get rid of the water or else your reactions go back the other way. These two guys, no problem. All right? They're not going to react with anything, which makes them one of the reasons why they're so popular. Any questions about that? So these are the initiators, and they serve to break apart and bust things open. So <coughs> that carbon-carbon double bond and these vital monomers we're talking about, we kind of talked about this a little bit already. We talked about uh, polyacetylene, which has a tendency to burst into flame when you expose it to air. All right, it's because it's got all those electrons, and those electrons are just itching to react with water especially and um, bursts into flame. And so this is a similar thing in which we have these double bonds, but now they're exposed to these free radicals. And the free radicals are, and the double bonds are prime targets for each other. All right, so it's looking to find something to react with, it sees the double bonds, and bang, starts the process. And so this free radical attacks an electron within the double bond to form a new pair of electrons, and this then forms a new carbon-carbon bond, and the remaining electron gives you that free radical. So that's kind of shown here, where we have this phenyl group with a free radical on it. It interacts with that double bond, and then it breaks it open, forms a normal carbon-carbon bond. Yes? Um, aren't CC bonds stronger than CH bonds? CC bonds. They because double bonds are stronger than single bonds? So I guess I'm wondering why the radical would attack. Yeah, so it has to do with PZ orbitals, and so those electrons are sitting up above the molecule. And so the norm so it's a 1s orbital, yeah, that's not going to break. That's definitely strong, but the PZ orbital is not the 1s, it's 2p. Okay. And so that 2p is much more exposed, that electron, remember it's floating up above it, and so this, this radical can find that electron cloud and react with it more easily. So yeah, you're absolutely right, a double bond is stronger than a single bond, a triple bond is st stronger than a double bond, but it doesn't mean those electrons are locked up where nothing can react with them. The different orbitals. Yes? Um, I don't know if you already said this, but like, for example, like AIBN, yep. how would you start the initiation process? How do you get that nitrogen bond to break? How do you? Oh, you know um, yeah, so typically it just takes a little bit of heat. Okay. All right, they're already very unstable, and you heat it up just very slowly until the reaction begins. Any other questions? Those are good questions. All right, and so what we end up with is uh, a little bit of the, the vinyl monomer we started out with, and there's a free radical on the end of it, that electron, all right? And so this is um, a little bit different from what we talked about earlier, but it still works. So the initiator molecule breaks down to form radicals, followed by a free radical reaction with a monomer molecule, specifically the double bond, the electron inside that double bond. And this is called the initial initiation step of polymerization. All right, and so after that, hopefully it makes sense. This new free radical reacts with another monomer. So it's another free radical finding another double bond, reacting with that, and this process just keeps going and going and going and going. Okay, Does everyone see that? And so we have this, in this case, this phenyl, group, phenyl terminated growing chain, which is just adding more and more and more monomers to itself as time goes by. And so that step is called propagation, where it just continues to add to its length. All right. This guy seeing wrong with that? Yes. So how does this affect like the actual properties of the polymer? If you have this other thing at the end yeah. that's not yeah, that's the a good, actual part of the that that's a good question. So um, you've got this polyethylene chain as is shown here and you've got these phenyl groups on the end of it and the uh, question is whether that really affects the properties or not and the answer is not much um, first off it's, it's all nonpolar secondly these guys are relatively rare all right so you know a hundred thousand monomers get incorporated in between the two phenyl groups and it's like well you know it's not going to make a big difference okay that's a good question all right, but that's also a consequence of the fact that it's high molecular weight. All right, it, making them rare makes them unimportant. Any other questions? And then termination, which can be uh, good or bad depending on what you're after. Uh, these free radicals are unstable and eventually will find a way to become paired without generating a new free radical. And when things are nicely behaved, this is called termination. 
and the most productive version of termination is for two growing chains to find each other. So these guys over here somewhere is a vinyl group, over there somewhere is another vinyl, uh, I'm sorry, phenyl group. Uh, they start from vinyls, they end up with phenyls, and then these guys, this is 50,000, that's 50,000, they find each other, and boom, you have a 100,000 molecular weight polyethylene chain. Right. That's, that's, the, that's the goal, that's the wish. And as I think I mentioned before, um, uh, biomedical polyethylene, the time that goes, type that goes into hip implants, you know, that's a million. All right, so this has to be 500,000 here and 500,000 there. They find each other at some point and then react and give you that million unit chain, okay, which is pretty impressive. Um, but you should also be realizing at this point that that's, they have to find each other. You know, this huge giant molecule and there's a little reactive group over here and there's another huge giant molecule and another little tiny free radical trying to find each other in all this mess. So there's, there's an art to it. Yes? So do you have a lot of variability in the chain length? Because what if, like how do you control when it terminates? You control the termination by the rarity of the initiator. So if the initiator is very rare, that you're going to get the 500,000. If you've got a lot of initiators, you generate a lot of growing chains, and the chain lengths become shorter. Okay. And could you have a, like the other part of the radical that came off? Could yeah. that go on the end of this? Like, could that terminate the reaction? Good. Go could on the end. you have a uh, CH2? Yeah. So what, what could that, like, come on the end of it? Oh, if you had enough initiators, or... Oh, you mean if enough enough growing molecules are present? Yeah, you can you can, and that's going to take a, a pretty large number of initiators. But yeah, you could shut down the reaction pretty quickly. If you want to make floor wax, that'd be one one way of doing it. Sure, but that's to do with statistics and rarity, basically. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you also just put like hydrogen gas in there to initiate it or to end it? Hydrogen gas? Why would you want hydrogen you make gas? CH three wouldn't that end the chain? Uh, hydrogen gas, uh, well, it's not going to be as reactive as another free radical. I don't think I've ever seen anybody use hydrogen gas to do that. I don't know if it would work or not, off the top of my head. Hydrogen gas is a kind of a stable diatomic molecule. It's not like oxygen, which is highly reactive. I don't think so, but I, I'm not certain. That's it. Could work. I'm not sure. Off the top of my head. Just, yeah, you probably have to use a lot of it to make that happen, to ov ov overcome the rarity problem. But it might work ultimately. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. So that's that's the the good story. Um, what can be a bad story, and we'll talk more about this when we get to uh, polydispersity, is is a termination reaction called disproportionation. And uh, this is when two growing chain ends come close together. And rather than simply joining with the unpaired electron, which is what we want them to do, the three radicals come together, it looks elsewhere. And so this is a kind of a consequence of just how reactive these three radicals are. We want them to find the other free radical and get together, <coughs> but instead they find a different piece of that same chain and react with that. So it's very annoying. Um, and you see that here in which this guy, instead of doing the obvious thing, because free radicals are stupid, they come over here and react with that carbon atom, okay? Instead of the carbon atoms you want them to react with, okay? Always reminds me of uh, floor vacuums. You know, the people get irritated because they don't just pick up the dirt that's right in front of them. It's like, well, they're stupid. You know, they don't they don't see the dirt. All right, this guy is just he's seeing something to react with. And the fact that there's a free radical right next to it is not an issue. It's, just, it's all about statistics and rarity and kinetics especially. And so anyway, so that, that reaction happens. And so you end up um, taking a hydrogen atom, putting it on that free radical, and terminating that chain of the hydrogen atom. All right, because of that direct reaction with the wrong carbon atom. And then, which uh, I don't know if it's just as bad or worse, you have now two free radicals, the one that was supposed to react with, and then the one you just created by hitting the wrong carbon atom with that free radical. And those guys get together and say, well, we'll just make a double bond. And so they make a double bond, and the chain ends that way. Okay. 
Now, now you asked me if, it, if we take an initiator in there and break it open again, we might be able to reverse that. Yes, we, we might, but not, it's not, not really done that way. And so the problem here is that, um, you know, we've caused this reaction to end a little bit early. Right? We've achieved termination, but it's not really the one we wanted. All right? And so we end up with chains that aren't quite as long as we'd like them to be. But this does happen. We'll talk about polydispersity and how that shows up in polydispersity. But unfortunately, this is a possibility. All right, so we have initiation, which breaks things open and gives us the, the phenyl group is the one I talked about, that finds a monomer and reacts with it to form this coupled combination of the monomer and the initiator species. And then when you do that, you activate that monomer now, and it finds other monomers and other monomers and other monomers. And eventually, you get something that is as long as you'd like it to be. And then best case, and this is where the million molecular weight polyethylene comes from, it finds another really long version of the, the radical ended chain, and they get together and form the desired species, which is a high molecular weight polymer. Disproportionation, on the other hand, gives us things that aren't quite exactly what we'd like, but um, we can end up with half of what we're looking for in the first reaction might still be useful. And molecular weight could be high enough that it's still good for us. So it's, it comes comes down to economics. So the initiation process is relatively slow, but it is continuous. So that's how concentration controls it. And then, as you'll see, molar mass builds up very quickly once a chain is initiated. All right. So we, we talk about it from the standpoint of rarity and things finding each other. But under the right circumstances, if you're not looking for too high molecular weight, the process can be pretty quick. And so that's shown here. And so this is styrene, all right? So this is what we use to make polystyrene, obviously. And we're looking at the time needed to reach a molecular weight of 10 to the sixth. Um, it doesn't give me conditions. I think I looked this up, it's like 50 degrees centigrade and a certain type of catalyst. And if you, under those appropriate conditions, it can get to 100,000 molecular weight, which is decent in 7.6 uh, seconds, all right? So pretty darn fast, all right, if you're not waiting around. Uh, methyl methacrylate, we've got this double bond over here, just like we had the double bond there. We're breaking it open with a free radical, causing it to react with its neighbors. That's 1.5 seconds, even faster. And then the champion is uh, vinyl chloride. So again, we have a double bond with a chlorine on it. We break that open, and we can get to 100,000 in 0.13 seconds. Is there a question? Yeah, so in this solution, are we assuming that it's just these re reacting with themselves, or is there like some kind of reactant? there to help generate the free radicals? Uh, well, yeah, you have an initiator in there to break open the double bonds and start the process. But it's, it's the same thing. That, that R ends up on the end of a growing monomer chain. Any other questions? All right, so this last one, as you'll notice, is, is pretty darn quick. All right, this is where way back I mentioned Ostrom Maslinsky in Russia, who started making PVC in 1927. And the problem he had was that it would blow up. And this is why, because this thing, once it gets going, is very fast. It generates a lot of heat in a very short amount of time. And so what you'll see in these reactors is they, they start the process, but it's sitting there in ice water or something else. So it cools off and sucks out the heat so that it doesn't catch on fire and blow up the building, for example. All right. And Ostro Mislinsky, his problem was that that uh, PVC monomer was, was not very pure in 1927. All right. They were just kind of making it on the fly in their garage. And so, um, while well he was able to make small amounts of PVC, making large amounts of PVC would take several more decades before they overcame this purity issue. And so, getting back to the question that was asked earlier, we also have a relationship between molecular weight and the concentrations of initiator and monomer. And uh, you know, one part of it should be pretty obvious, and that the molecular weight is proportional to the concentration of the monomer. All right, more monomer, longer chains. That should make sense. What's um, probably more important is the fact that it's also proportional to the inverse square root of the initiator concentration, okay? So that means that to increase molecular weight, um, you can increase the monomer concentration, those two make sense, but you can also decrease the initiator concentration and get increased molecular weight as well. All right, does everyone see that? So if you wanna go to a million, very little initiator, 10,000, you can have more initiator, probably a lot more initiator. 
So it's about the, all about these guys finding each other and stopping and terminating the reaction when the chains are long enough, or if you want short chains, then you add more initiator. Any questions about that? Um, yeah. That's a good, like, quick definition for initiator, because it causes like, free radicals, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a free radical that is sitting on the end of some type of organic. Those okay. are the initiators. So we had the phenyl, and we had the oxygen, uh, previously for AIBN and benzoyl peroxide. All right, those are those free radicals. And so we, we drop the AIBN concentration way down, we'll get a high molecular weight. Any other questions? Probably do it. And so these are examples of polymers synthesized using this process. And so these should all be very familiar to you. And again, as I've, as I've done before, yeah, we can think about it alg algebraically. We can program in R when it's hydrogen, it's polyethylene. When it's CH3, it's polypropylene. When it's a phenyl group, it's polystyrene. And when it's chlorine, it's polyvinyl chloride. All right. Everything is the same, at least in theory. I mean, in, in practice, you know, temperatures are totally different. Um, you might not be using the same initiators, but the same process happens. You're breaking open that double bond, and it's finding monomers that have not been reacted with. And then a little more exotically, compared to what you're seeing, we can make ROH. We get polyvinyl alcohol, which is a polymer that's useful because it dissolves in water. Um, there's lots of advantages to polymers that dissolve in water for certain types of treatments. And another one is polyvinyl acetate, which uh, you know, dissolves in water, sort of. Dissolves in other things better. And again, in that case, you make R something else. All right. So it's a very flexible method within reason for making polymers that can be whatever you want them to be, really, in terms of side groups. And so, you know, we talk about the big six, and I'm showing you, I don't know, probably several dozen more um, during class. There are tens of thousands of polymers out there, most of which aren't good for anything. Um, but occasionally, one comes along, and it's got a very specific special property, and it becomes a commercial polymer. But there are, if not tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of polymers that have been made. Chemists um, are always since 1927 or so, they've been trying to strike it rich for the next whatever. All right, so the golden age of polymers is people you know, hitting the low-hanging fruit, and coming up with these polymers that are all around us now. All right, and they all, let's get past it. A lot of them started with this type of chemistry. We also have polyacrylic acid, in which we now have this X being hydrogen and the R in this case. Um, being these other species, in this case hydrogen, when X is CH3, when R is CH3, you have polymethyl methacrylate, and then we have other versions of polyacrylamide, which is a useful adhesive, polyacrylonitrile, which we'll talk about in a moment, and polytetrafluoroethylene. These are all examples of that. It should be not fluoroethylene, fluoroethylene. Um, Anyway, but that starts again with a double bond between two carbon atoms. In this case, we have, instead of hydrogens all around, we have fluorines all around. Same process. And if you might remember the, the example I gave you about, uh, his name escapes me, the guy with the uh, cylinder of tetrafluoroethylene gas. I, that happened at room temperature in a gas bottle. So the iron, or probably the chromium, acted as a catalyst to make tetrafluoroethylene gas at room temperature turn into a polymer layer. His name will come to me in a minute. Come on, where is it? So you don't necessarily have to go to really extreme conditions to make this happen. Any questions about all that so far? All right, makes sense. And then we can go further than this and get into a very um, important area of uh, rubber chemistry. And this is important because we have things that are called dienes. So not just one double bond, but two double bonds in the same molecule. All right, and so now we can start to think about having something that has the ability to grow in two different directions rather than just the one we've been talking about. Isolated dienes, many monomers have multiple vinyl groups capable of polymerizing independently, two double bonds. Therefore, these monomers are capable of forming four or more bonds to other molecules 
leading to potentially cross-link systems. And so we talked about cross-link polymers last time, and this is some of the guts of what that chemistry looks like in this context. So we have this species, divinyl benzene, which is just that phenyl group. Now we have double bonds on both sides, or both ends of this, this benzene group. It gets hit up with the initiator, everything breaks open, and then it finds its neighbors, and it's off to the races. All right. And so rather than just a single bond with the monomers, we're making two bonds with a, a neighboring mon monomer. And so we ha make a polymer that looks like this, which is largely regarded as a thermoset. Because it's got all those bonds holding everything together. So it's not just a nice squiggly little linear chain like polyethylene. This is a big beefy thing. So it's, it's hard for those chains to move around relative to each other. So it acts like a thermoset. All right, and this is used together with styrene to create cross-link beads for chromatography packings, ion exchange resins, and viral vaccine production, by the way. Um, biopharmaceuticals use this a lot. So all the vaccines that are out there now, they start with this type of material that makes those beads, and they use that to separate things out. This polyvinyl benzene, very useful polymer. So we have other dienes besides those relatively exotic ones we have what's called butadiene and so now we have a bunch of polymer a uh, bunch of uh, double bonds that can react and break open and form things we have isoprene we have chloroprene um, again you guys know what chlorine does right it gives you a, a polymer that's more stable uh, that's why pvc is what does what pvc does things can't grow on pvc because it's chlorinated all right they can kind of get a foothold in some of the uh, the other components of the big sick, but, but um, PVC is really inert. And so in this context, though, we have whatever initiator starts the process off, and we end up with a couple different outcomes, which we'll talk more about later, but um, we can get this to kink in one direction and give us a free radical, or we can get it to kink in the other direction and also give us a free radical. And in the end, this gives us First examples of what's called trans configuration, all right, where they're on opposite sides of that double bond versus cis configuration, where we're on the same side of that double bond. Now, those of you who are get organic chemistry are saying, oh my God, am I going to see this again? Uh, a little bit. So we talk about cis and trans because it's technologically important, because a cis polymer can have very different properties than a trans polymer. All right, so this is why I have to talk about this, because this is how we control these plastics and their behavior. So it looks like nothing. It looks like a trivial thing, but it turns out it makes a big difference. Is there a question? Uh, I got it, sir. You got it? All right. Does everyone kind of see that? We're not going to have to know how to, like, move bonds with them, right? Move what? Like, I guess we don't need, we don't need to know how the electrons really are, like, we would never have to know how to No, 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 no. You know, the stuff I'm just showing you, no. Those, all those arrows, no. No, I'm not going to ask you to diagram out these alpha substitutions or something, or whatever is going on. No. Don't worry. Too much. Again, I, this is not an organic chemistry class. I'm not going to try to turn you into that. Algebra, yeah, we'll do some algebra. I mean, that's what we've been doing is algebra. But that's not so hard to grasp. Come on. So this guy, that's what ends up turning into that other guy. All right. So these guys break open and you end up leaving a double bond in the middle of it, all right? Butadiene goes to a butadiene um, incorporation into a copolymer, okay. okay? Come on. So we have this particular diene class. Again, we do think al algebraically and say, okay, well, we got the reactive species and we just put an R on there and we get one polymer versus another polymer versus the third polymer, all of which are useful. So if R is hydrogen, we have what's called polybutadiene, which is a rubber when it has the cis structure, all right? So it's a useful, flexible material when it's got cis structure. We turn it into trans, which you think is nothing, but it's brittle with a trans structure. It's soft and rubbery with a cis structure. Right, so that's the first example of why that's important. We can make a CH3 instead of an R. We have what's called polyisoprene, which is another very useful rubber. And then when we throw in chlorine, we have polychloroplene. 
And so these are all examples of polymerization of these dienes that give us these low glass transition materials that we think of as rubber. Polyisoprene, which is natural rubber, consists of more than 90% polyisoprene. Polychloroprene was developed by DuPont in the 1930s. They looked at, at PVC and said, hey, can we make a rubber out of that that's got all the environmental resistance that PVC has? And so they said, let's, let's put chlorine in and see what happens. And it's still used for hoses today. It's still a very useful hose material that resists a lot of things that you can throw at it, particularly water-based suspensions. Go ball. All right. Everything you've seen before, of course, are homopolymers. Um, and we know from what we talked about previously that these are a single monomer. And we also know that copolymers involve two or more monomer types. Okay. And so this gets into um, some of the more exotic sides of, of polymer science and um, plastics production. But it involves the same type of, of breaking open of double bonds, the same type of initiator breaking of double bonds. And in this case, rather than finding the same monomer everywhere, it finds different monomers and incorporates those into a copolymer structure. And so we have a N of monomer A and M of monomer B. And so um, a lot of what we think about when we think about copolymers is we have one of monomer A and one of monomer B, and we get this nice mix and match of A and B all the way down the chain. That's not necessarily always the case. We can have um, N of monomer A and M of monomer B uh, where N and M are not the same, or they're not one, or they could be 10. N and M could be 10, or M could be 11, and N is 10. All right, we get into what's called block copolymers at that point and we'll, we'll go into that in some more detail. But one way of describing this is poly MA co MB, which is, uh, we'll talk more about the naming uh, nomenclature here pretty shortly. And so what we're doing then is we're initiating monomer A or initiating monomer B, and this can be the same initiator. In fact, it almost always is. And then you create this reactive species, and if it finds more monomer A, we add to that length, um, and then it could add monomer B, and then we could have a block of A and a block of B, or one B and a block of A, or a block of B and one A. It's, it's endless in terms of what you can do if you can just control the input ratios. All right, this is where, again, purity is really important because what you get out reflects what you put in. And so you can start with the B side, the B monomer, or the A monomer, and then kick the reaction into whatever direction you want it to go. All right, so it's really flexible. Again, if you control conditions and Again, giant reactors with Teflon coatings, and they're in nitrogen-filled rooms, and nobody's allowed to go in, but they're not wearing a bunny suit and a respirator. All, you know, very extreme conditions because small things make big differences in these types of reactions. And so this is one example, and it um, should look a little familiar because we have N and M. So you know Lindsay polyethylene is X and Y, and it's a, it's a copolymer made by the, these types of techniques, right? And so in this context, we have styrene being added to methyl methacrylate. So that's styrene, and that's methyl methacrylate. And we're polymerizing them together. And we can pick the values of N and M that we like. All right, the longer one, the more properties of, uh, of that monomer will dominate the result. So we put a lot of styrene into it. We know it's going to be a little more brittle. We put a lot of polymethyl methacrylate into it, probably be less brittle. So it depends on where you want to go and what properties you're looking for. All right, this is all part of why plastics have become, and that is useful. I'm mean, popular so quickly because they are really, really tailorable. And so one example that you guys are familiar with, <coughs> polyacrylyl co-butadiene or nitrine butadiene rubber. And so you guys have all worn gloves in our labs, hopefully, whether they're purple or blue or whatever color, they're poly, this, this, nitrile butadiene rubber gloves. Uh, you still find some uh, latex one out there, but people have reactions to latex, so not so much anymore. We, we used to have a lot of those around, but now we've gone to these types of gloves. And so these are all made from this chemistry, where again, you control the amount of the nitrile groups and the butadiene rubber groups, and you vary N and M to suit whatever it is you want this to do. Um, in general, hopefully it makes a little bit of sense, you know, the, the more of the butadiene you have in the, the more rubbery and soft it is, all right? The uh, acrylonitrile, that nitrogen has some ability to do polar bonding, hydrogen bonding with its neighbors. And so 
again, you tweak it. You may have a lot, the n could be much higher than m, but you, know, you still need a little bit of this to give you good properties so that it's not too soft and you're trying to protect yourself with it. And the other advantage is that because of that combination of materials, resistant to oil, fuel, and other chemicals, and of course we use it for gloves, automotive industry to make fuel and oil handling hoses, seals, and tires due to its ability to withstand a wide range of temperatures from minus 40 to 120. Okay. So along with dialing in N and M to change mechanical properties, we can dial in N and M to change the glass transition too, depending on what we want it to do. And you can think about it. All right. We also have polystyrene cobutadiene. Um, if you don't realize it by now, this is endless. You can put all kinds of stuff together and get all kinds of things out of it. So the styrene, oops, styrene component and the butadiene component. Glass transition is minus 55. That's not plus 55, minus 55, so well below room temperature. Yes? Um, if you want to keep double bonds in your uh, monomer, are you somehow able to like protect them from the radical? Or are uh, are you yes. So remember, so this 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 guy. This, that's a good question. So this guy, remember, it came from the a starting compound with two double bonds in it, and you broke open both ends and put the in this case the double bond in the middle. So it is protected, but both of these ends can react and go off in okay. those directions. So the answer is yes. You can do that, but you need two two double bonds to end up with one in the end. So they're just on the ends. That's more likely to react with the. Well, ones. yeah. So you you start out. Um, so what do you want a rubber to do? You want the polymer chains to move past each other, right? A way of doing that then to take away side groups, all right? So rather than two hydrogens, one on each carbon, you only have one hydrogen on each carbon. So it's much easier for those, those guys to slide past each other. A lot, of, a lot less atoms banging into each other, all right? So this makes sense in terms of a, a rubber. Usable range minus 40 to 100 C, good physical properties, excellent abrasion resistance, which is something you can only find out. You can't really actually predict that. Good electrical properties. Does have some sensitivity to wastewater and oil, uh, but it is blended in with natural rubber. So all the car tires you drive around on are a blend of SBR and natural rubber. Those two things together, along with all the carbon black and whatever else they put in there, are determined. It determines the difference between a 45,000 mile tire and a 75,000 mile tire. All right. All has to do with how much work and what type of chemistries and how much those cost. So, uh, what better? And then, uh, last but not least, certainly, is something that's called polyacrylonitrile cobutadiene co styrene, which sounds really complicated. Um, it's amazing, however, it, it is very useful. It goes by the trade name of ABS. And it consists of a lot of we, what we just talked about. We have the, the diene, we have the styrene, and we have this, this nitrile group, this carbon triply bonded to a, a, a nitrogen. And so this material, as complicated as it is, is, is uh, first off, it's stronger than polystyrene because the nitrile groups in the acrylonitrile units, uh, they are polar, they are attracted to each other, they cause hydrogen bonding. Um, and so I always think of this as kind of being the next step after uh, polyethylene terephthalate, which as you recall has two different things in it that make it a useful material. It's got some ethylene and it's got this terephthalic acid component and that can engage in hydrogen bonding. This is the kind of the same story. We have rubber that makes it soft, we have styrene that makes it kind of bulky, and then we have the nitrogen, the, the nitrile group that makes it polar. And the beauty of it is you can have different values of M, P and N. And so, you know, dial it in wherever you want. Somebody out there has a chart, I'm sure, that says if we change P by this much, here's what happens to the modulus. If we change it back the other way, the modulus does something else. All right, they've tinkered with this, they've made all these polymers, a lot of these different M, value, M and M and P values, and looked at the properties. And so they, they know what this can do, and they can, to, to, they can supply a certain ABS to you for whatever it is you need it to do. All right, strong attractions hold the chains together tightly, making it very strong. And the presence of the rubbery polybutadiene makes it tougher, okay? And so this is where you, you take that strong hydrogen binding and you kind of back it off with something that's very soft, all right? 
And so this is, again, all part of the game. You want that strong bonding, but you still want it to give a little bit. It's a lot like PET. And uh, it's got a glass transition of 105, so relatively high temperature. But again, because of the rubber groups, we don't care as much. It's not going to shatter when you drop it on the floor. It's also, because of all this, this complicated stuff in it, it's also amorphous, which should not be a big surprise. I mean, you've got, you can't ask these guys to polymerize with each other, all right, or themselves either. They're just not likely to find much of the other component in the neighboring polymer chain because it got all other stuff in the way. All right, and so that is, is handy. It's got no true melting point, and it also controls its properties to a large extent, such that it has historically been used to make all landline phones are made from ABS. Cell phones are not. I looked into that. Uh, they're not made from ABS. But landline phones, where they still exist, um, which is a lot fewer places now, are made from ABS. Strength and rigidity of acrylonitrile and styrene polymers, toughness of the rubber, high impact resistance. Sorry, so uh, phones have been dropped on the floor for going to say 100 years, but it's not quite there yet. Anyway, but because of ABS and its abilities, they don't shatter. They just bounce. Very strong, tough, lightweight. Automotive body parts, refrigerator components. The inside of your refrigerators are typically ABS. 3D printers are, are using ABS somewhat. Um, others are, other polymers are more popular. It is a, a better pipe than a PVC uh, because of its enhanced resistance to, to fracture. And um, in these low temperature situations especially, it can be preferred over PVC. Okay, any questions about all that? All right, so we'll talk more about copolymers and uh, all the weird and wonderful structures you can get in, uh, on Monday. Or no, yeah, Monday. Okay, see you guys, have a good weekend.